And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, previously responsible for things like the Cthulhu hack and the D sanction. Now kickstarting Sanction, a role-playing game of challenges and hacks. The one and only Paul Baldowski. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on and braving the hell of time zones. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Seven, seven in the evening is good for me. Mm -hmm. It's it's fine. Yeah, no, no problem at all. Seven in the evening for you, one in the afternoon for me. Yep, that sounds perfect. And it's some, yeah, somehow that's one of the more sane time zone differences I've had to deal with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's good. That's good for me. I have had times in the past when people have said, any problem with three o'clock in the morning? Mm, yeah, no. Uh, well, and so, so I, had jo I had joke, somebody had jokingly asked if, I, if I'd have an easier time if I move, if I moved to the UK or something. And I had simply said, no, knowing my luck, I'd, if I moved to the UK, I'd end up getting a bunch of guests in the, from the States. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't be fixing the problem. I'd be just trading it with another problem. Yeah, and you, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, it doesn't matter where you are. Inevitably, you're going to end up having to, uh, to, to run some awkward times with, uh, uh, with gaming being a sort of worldwide hobby. Yeah. I liken it to when... Um, when some of my re when some of my relatives moved up, moved out of the st moved out of the state to warmer climates because they were sick of they were sick of the long winter and then they end up getting long summers with with rain constantly like uh -huh. <laughs> but hey you you don't have to deal with the long winter so what's the so what's the problem i would say to rub salt in the wound because i don't believe in hitting a man while he's down i believe in kicking him cuz that's easier Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I live in Manchester in England, so I, I have uh, some fairly choice weather to contend with. It rains here quite a lot, um, and summers are never particularly long. So. Yeah, if, whenever I whenever I bring up min um, winters in Minnesota, where I am, ev everybody who I've spoken to in the UK looks at me like I'm crazy because of because of how cold it gets, especially in January. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. No, I know. I, I imagine it's, uh, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, it's bad enough that remote car starters are almost a, are, are almost a given. <laughs> you know, hit hit a button on your key, hit a button on your keys, start the car up so that it's so that so that it's a little bit warm by the time you get out there. Yeah. You know, that sounds good. I'll have to look out for that <laughs> next time I up uh, up change the car to uh, something a bit better. Sounds great. <laughs> but. It, if, although um, since since you're in, given where you are, I ha I will extend my sympathies for putting up with Manchester United fans. <laughs> well, I'm not I'm not going to say a word about football. I, I don't want to alienate anybody on any level. <laughs> <laughs> I w I will. I'll s I talk I talk as much shit I talk as much shit about a football on both sides of the pond. <laughs> Well, I'll leave that in your capable hands. Because <laughs> I hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal. In, ah. in other words, everybody gets the roast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fair enough. Fair enough. Good. So, getting back on sane things. Um, <laughs> yep, yep. I'd like you to walk me through your humble beginnings at when it comes to this weird and wonderful hobby. Walk me through how your first introduction and what made it stick. Um, well, I mean, my first introduction was I, I genuinely struggled with the years, maybe 1983, 1984. I was in school. Um, I was quite keen to keep out of the bad weather. Um, and the opportunity arose basically to join the school band, which gave you access to uh, the music rooms. And once uh, we were in the warm while everyone else was suffering out in the uh, in the in the playground um, we then 
one, I think lunchtime, somebody basically pulled these red, uh, the red books of, of uh, Red Box D and D out and asked if we wanted to have a game. Um, I played Ironheart the Fighter, going uh, in search of the uh, uh, foul wizard who was hiding in uh, uh, a dungeon nearby. I remember a first fight against a uh, giant centipede or a, a carrion crawler or whatever they're called. Um, and that was pretty much it. Uh, we just, it was uh, an opportunity not only to be in the warm, but to have some uh, um, good, solid entertainment uh, pretty much every lunchtime throughout my uh, uh, time in, in school. Mm -hmm. oh, I can relate to hi to hiding out in the music room since, well, I did flute at one, at one point, and being around the percussion people are in it, uh, and especially the brass people are an interesting case, especially, especially when, when somebody gets bored and decides to put parts of their, of their tuba on their head. <laughs> now, see, now, see, you're wandering into dangerous territory, as I would have been in the brass. Uh, I, I played trombone. So, um, you know, uh, but as I said, it, it just gave us the opportunity. And after D&D, &D, um, we all sort of pitched in as uh, GMs as well as players. So uh, we sort of played um, Star Trek, faster mm -hmm. Star Trek, Call of mm -hmm. Cthulhu, um, uh, Warhammer when it came out later in the 80s, AD&D, &D, um, uh, and I ran um, Middle Earth role playing game from Iron Crown. Yeah, so, it, a lot of I've I've noticed a pattern that a, a lot of people um, o over in the UK had had gotten their start with MERP. Um, which what will always be funny to me about MERP is that it is designed to be a simpler version of Role Master, which it technically is. <laughs> If we're gra yeah. if we're grading on a curve, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Oh. And... No, I agree. I, yeah, but it's but it's yeah. I mean, <laughs> I get what you're saying, mm -hmm. um, and and I know. I mean, uh, I have uh, I too. Uh, I'm fearful of uh, role master in its all its uh, tabular glory, um, and I agree. Uh, Merp was was not quite not a far slide down the curve of complexity, but somehow it. It still made for certain entertaining, if not necessarily thematically appropriate games. <laughs> well, I like I like in it. I like in it. Merp being a slight being a slightly simplified version of Rollmaster. I like into uh, how getting getting shot with a beanbag is less lethal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Technically true, but kind of misleading. Yes, yeah, no, I, I, it, it's, it's, it's fair. It's a fair call. Um. <laughs> and in all, in all fairness, when it comes, when it comes to what people would, do, what people, what people in the horn section would, do, would do, um, when, the, when they got bored, well, I'll, I'll always, rem I'll always remember this infamous image, which I, ju I just shared with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's an uh, totally inappropriate use of uh, of brassware. <laughs> an inappropriate use, but when when you have enough when you have enough people with enough free time and there's and there's and they are sufficiently bored, they do dumb things. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I help. I think there's uh, there's a potential uh, bestry entry in 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 that. I think for possibly in a few games. Um, yeah. No, that's. Uh, I yeah. did. I did have a running gag of a monster called the called the Evil Tuba Man, Terror of Percussion Land, <laughs> because I, I was ripping off the um, I, I was ripping off the Terror of Balloon Man from from Boy Meets Dog. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Which, no, that's it is pretty terrifying. <laughs> mm -hmm. So now, as I as I understand it, this is. This sanction is is a more setting agnostic um, successor to the D sanction, which which um what walk me th walk me through um how how that came to be because you had you had said at one point that 
the D sanction was a setting in need of a rule set. Yes. Yeah. So, so for me at least, okay, I've I've always had an interest in history. But I, I I sort of took a degree in history at university, and this sort of uh, the sort of period of the Tudors and the Stuarts, uh, sort of 1500s, 1600s, were of a sort of keen interest for me. So um, I, I'd always been interested in it, and something something hit me, uh, possibly not a beanbag, um, in 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I just came up with this this idea around the notion that... Um, in, in an age, uh, the Elizabethan age, magic and sort of science were sort of hand in hand. Uh, one uh, no more sort of um, believed or supported than the other. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I had this notion of, of John Dee basically seeking approval from Queen Elizabeth to uh, save people who would otherwise be executed to use them uh, for her benefit. Um, so I had this idea, and I was—I had adventures, and you know, I was playtesting, um, and I kept trying to find a um, a mechanic that fit the theme. I, I I I absolutely understand the concept of people who find a game, you know, with with a mechanic so solid that they can turn it to any any theme or claim they can turn it to any theme but i I, on the other hand am quite keen to often find a theme first and then potentially support it with a mechanic that strengthens and sort of rounds out the theme and 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 adds more to the game as a result so i was desperately trying to find that and initially i was using cards i was using tokens i was using a fairly simple a uh, uh, fairly simplistic dice mechanic at one point, um, basically just using d6s. Uh, and um, yeah, the very first version of it was literally rolling two d6s and wanting to get uh, a seven, mm-hmm. which is quite a narrow band of <laughs> possibility. Like 16% chance of success is quite narrow. But what I had in my head, for whatever reason, was when I, back in the old days, back in the 80s and 90s when I was playing games, um, there was this tendency that, generally speaking, you know, you would roll, you'd probably roll three d six for your 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 raw characteristics or attributes, mm-hmm. and due to the nature of the the bell curve on those, you'd end up with something that might have eleven, twelve, thirteen as a stat. So roughly speaking, you were on a fifty fifty chance of achieving things, and the same went for skills. Generally speaking, you either if you had skills in the game, you'd you'd dump a whole pile of points in something to make yourself really good, and everything else you'd probably uh, layer out um, into a sort of uh, a scattering of almost pointless skills that you hoped you might be able to roll under. Um, but so ultimately, you'd be pretty good some of the time, and I, that's the mechanic I was after. Um, and it wasn't until after the Cthulhu hack, where which was based on the Black hack by David Black, which mm-hmm. was very 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 popular in 2016 basically explosion of hacks of uh, of the black hack Thule hack came out in during that explosion uh, but over the course of the the time as i was writing more material for it more adventures and supplements i found that the game was uh, developing away from the original black hack mechanics and it was beginning to rely upon um the notion of what was called the usage die and the idea of that was uh, if you had equipment, if you used arrows in combat or, or, or a gun, you instead of keeping track of the arrows, you would roll a usage die. And if you rolled on one or two, uh, the die would drop in, in value from, say, a eight-sided to a six-sided, six-sided to four-sided. And I was, for some reason, that, that worked really well in my head for Cthulhu Hack because sanity kind of works that way. You know, you you face things and there's a chance that what you are seeing is enough to crack or break you and you, you drop down. So anyway, I had this that mechanic then in my head for some reason it, and it stuck with me. Um, and when I finally, I think I was <laughs> reaching a point of despair maybe by 2019, 2018, 2019, several years after I'd started working on Desanction and run piles of adventures which were the adventures themselves were getting pretty solid, but I was just not getting the real system. I then honed in on the fact that 
this notion of character generation in the past when everything was so 50 50 well uh, rolling a d4 and not wanting to get a one or two that's the same that's 50 50 chance so if i have a game where you use a d4 or maybe even a d6 to represent the characteristics and attributes then aren't i just doing the same as i was doing but extract it, abstracting it down into a single dice being rolled mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's the core system for the desanction and, and 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 effectively it was written as sanction before it came became desanction i originally called it actually the utility system mm -hmm. i was clearly searching for a name um uh, and i wrote up the source uh, sort of the, the source reference document or with the SRD um, and then built the desanction theme around it um, uh, but I then had that that generic rule set in mind in the background of this fairly simple w way of basically allowing a character to be good most of, well fairly good most of the time <laughs> which which might not seem <laughs> You know innovative or anything but it, it kind of felt like that's what the way a lot of games had been written you know mm -hmm. you were fairly good most of the time so why not have you know this abstract mechanic to, to manage it and that and that's what the sanction system is but from that core you then build up around it so for example the d sanction has that core for the the, the core resources or attributes of the character they're called resources in the game mm -hmm. Uh, which is physical, I intellectual, and supernatural. But on top of that, you add things like an, a, a fairly lightweight, um, it's almost like a miracle more than a magic system where you have angelic, an angelic power that you can use every session. There's also some notions around tradecraft as you're a spy, so there's a way to effectively deal with bad guys in a kind of episodic way and so there's just there are plugins to the core system that then as with my earlier efforts are intended to support and um empower the theme of the game mm -hmm. so you have a core mechanic and then some something that empowers the theme um and but ultimately you know have a system that you can you can work up from and, I, and I, I noted after I had published the desanction, uh, with some measure of relief of finally, after whatever, seven years, mm -hmm. finally getting it in print, I noticed that people were posting on social media that they were running games using the desanction uh, and, uh, uh, and not setting it in the, the Elizabethan setting. I saw people running things like, I don't know, Rogue Trooper from 2000 AD, or they were running... <laughs> You know, it, it, or, or, or and there was a reference to a Judge Dread one. There was a reference to a sort of um, a cult uh, horror, which was strange considering I already had Cthulhu hack. They were using the D sanction to run it, and so people were hacking the system mm -hmm. before I had before I had considered sort of opening it up to to be hacked. Yeah. Um, and that and so that kind of supported the notion that, that it was viable to do it. So. And, and and here we are now, 2023, and uh, and sanction is becoming something in its own right. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the things I I do I do find interesting is there it unless unless I have unless I've mis, unless I've misread something. You're using you're using the full set of polyhedrals, but you don't have it at you don't have it set. As far in so in so far as there isn't a um, set die size that is going to be used, the only the only thing is don't ro is don't roll a one or a two. Essentially, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing you don't generally roll is a d twenty, which mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, because the yeah the the ladder from f four, six, eight, ten, and twelve. Is a is a relatively smooth one, mm -hmm. and and that you know without going into Dungeon Crawl Classics uh, sort of dice sets and going for the uh, the weird and wonderful polyhedrals between twelve and twenty, there's no way to go for a smooth uh, uh, ascendancy. So um, yeah, it, 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 a, a character will <clears throat> when a character in the core game is created, 
you will probably have a, a D4, or D6, or maybe a D8. Um, you kind of can start with D, uh, D6s across your, your core abilities, mm -hmm. but you can tweak, tweak it a little bit. Um, but then the notion is that you, um, as part of the game, you will seek to find ways to improve your situation. So, you know, if you're trying to pick a lock, knowing that you've found a good set of lock picking tools is going to mean that when you come to actually complete the task and the, uh, the game moderator says, you know, that you need to make a um, an intellectual roll because it's it's not so much physical or, or you know or, or your mental it's 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 knowing how locks work and whatever so we'll make an, an intellectual roll and mm -hmm. if you've if you've got an intellectual of uh, of a six sided die but you also show that you've got the tools then the game moderator is going to you know is likely to allow you to step it up and you can use a, an eight sided die. Mm -hmm. um, and potentially, maybe possibly, if you've got like devices as a skill, um, given the fact that in theory anybody can try and pick a lock without necessarily having any specific training, if you have a specific training which the de device the devices skill might give you, then you might be able to step it up again, which means that you're rolling a d10 instead of a d6. Mm -hmm. But at the end of that task. You know, you you are still ultimately only a D six in your intellectual. It's just on that instance, you know, things have gone <laughs> well that you're prepared and you have some expertise. On the other hand, if things are not going well, maybe the conditions are bad, the light is poor, you're trying to pick a lock with you know a broken um, stick from a uh, uh, from a popsicle, then you know the the GM has every right to say, well, let's let's drop that to a D four. Or, or maybe even say, look, I'm going to drop this below a D4. What that means is you have a call to fail, which basically means you can still pick the lock, but something really bad is going to happen as a result of it. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't even roll a dice at that point. Um, you are literally deciding whether you want to fail um, in a very spectacular way to the extent that you know you will still get through the door, but I don't know, you're going to bring the whole house you know, not literally down on top of you, but you're going to set off uh, alarms. Maybe a police car is actually going past as you're doing it, um, and the moment you open the door, the the uh, security light starts flashing directly above. So you're in the worst possible situation, but the door's still open. <laughs> it's not co not totally lost, but. Um, um, you know, again, looking back to the games we used to, I used to play, you know, generally speaking, the game was always moving forward, even when things went badly. I mean, unless, of course, you were playing Merp and you managed to roll that one that involved getting a, 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 your ears cleaned by a, 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 a somebody's arrow going through your, your ear, ear canal. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, so, so, so that's the notion in terms of the, uh, the abilities and how they work. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things I did see is there seems there seems to be the implication that alternatively, instead of using dice, you could use a you could you could use a deck of playing cards, which is is an interesting move because I fi I've always found that playing cards are just card based resolution mechanics are still largely untapped. Um, I know some people will bring up Savage Worlds. That doesn't count, because <laughs> that because that's just for tracking initiative. I'm talking using cards as a resolution mechanic, like in say, um, Saga System from T from TSR with both Marvel Adventure and um, Dragonlance Fifth Age, or the more recent Saga Machine games like Against the Dark Yogi or Faith. Though that is basically cases where a card where a card is the primary um, means of resolution. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to... I would say I'm halfway there um, in that um, the notion was, as I said, originally when I'd looked at the desanction, I was all kind of looking at mechanics that weren't dice. I was looking at tokens, I was looking at cards, 
And I think by the time I actually got round to formulating the sanction system, I still had that knocking on, on, you know, somewhere in my hind brain as being uh, something that I wanted to include. So in some measure, the game is built in such a way that um, cards can be used as a replacement for dice, mm -hmm. but certain as certain aspects of it, for example, in 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 the D sanction, there um, part of the game revolves around the fact that um, reality is being um, kind of torn apart in something called the unraveling. Um, it's due to King Henry the Eighth um, being the arrogant, greedy upstart that he was, wanting to break away from the church and ultimately destroy all of the Catholic uh, sort of monasteries and priories in, in England. And this causes a breakdown in the, the, the substance of our reality, allowing horror, you know, horrors and supernatural things to leak through. And the notion of unraveling was that it then thematically tied into the historical and medical idea of the humors, whereby each person was made up of four different substances, effectively mm -hmm. their their phlegm, black bile, yellow bile, and blood. Um, and so, conveniently enough, there was a way to use the actual suits of the card to therefore link into those um, those humors, for mm -hmm. example. Um, and there is a... Um, I, there, there are, you know, sort of ideas that I have on paper around a, um, a sort of um, a system for generating... Um, situations and encounters which is also reliant upon the notion that the different suits represent different kinds of um uh, situation or activity uh, whether it's to do with um um destruction violence wealth or, or whatever but i in, in a way i've i've used it as a literal you know attempt to find a way not to be stuck with a die and i i know that most most gamers will have them to hand but some some gamers appreciate the opportunity to, to try something different and actually with a lot of you know in 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 recent times with the up, upsurge in a lot of um solo and journaling games and things like that a lot of those use things like packs of cards or, or alternate means of generating um events and uh, situations so mm -hmm. it just felt, it felt like an opportunity of of, of of trying to tap into the use of of cards as a, as, a, as a mechanism so i mean that will that will that is part of the sanction system and will be included as part of that as well. And again, it ties into my desire to, to make the mechanics thematically fit the, the, the setting. So um, I will be interested in how my, uh, my brain works around that with some of the ideas. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, since... With desanction, it was it was building around a particular set, a particular setting. But sanction is building itself to be setting agnostic. So I'm cu I'm curious um, what some of the, what some of the things that you had to um, you had to address because of the fact that you're not, that you don't have the inbuilt um, aspect of playing as playing as agents the way you would in the sanction with the sanction system as a whole. So, I mean, the, 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 core, the core aspect of character and how characters are generated within the system um, uses um, what I would very lightly consider a kind of life path of considering different key inputs or events that have made them what they are at the point in time where the, where the player is stepping into their shoes to take control. The notion that the character has, you know, been places before. So in the desanction, a character is is made up of their their career prior to when they became an agent for the queen. Mm -hmm. They have uh, an involvement with a um, a disreputable occult organization or, or group, and they have been exposed to a specific um, work on maths, magic, or uh, some other supernatural element and each of those elements of their backstory is included in a table within the uh, within the rules and you either roll or pull a card or even pot potentially choose entries from that 
and each of them has a um, a number of skills associated with them. So your occupation might have three skills, your uh, the group you are associated with might have three, and your exposure to like as I said, like a magic book might have give you two more. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then from those eight skills at character generation, you choose three of them and they make up your, your, your strongest areas of expertise. So touching up, as I said, my reference earlier, they would be the skills that you'd put, you know, quite a lot of points in, you know, development points in, in generation in a different game. These will be the skills that people turn to you and say, this, this one's on you and let you do the, uh, you know, take, take, take the, uh, the, the action. So, um, the same therefore applies with sanction as a base that the notion is that you will consider the actual background to the game um, and you will um, look at how that background feeds into when the players arrive on the scene so like one of the um, one of the things with sanction is it, it will discuss this as a general concept and will lay out how you as a game moderator may choose to construct these tables um to uh, to support character generation mm -hmm. um but it won't actually it won't actually set out any specifics other than sort of examples mm -hmm. so um but there there will be like a list of example skills but purely as an example the idea is that um uh, you you choose whatever skills you want to include in your game because you know a um, a game that's about modern uh, espionage is not going to have exactly the same set of skills that a game about um, you know treasure hunters in Henry the Eighth England they're, they're they're completely different you know there will be some overlap in some of the skills but there are clearly going to be significant differences as well during the uh, due to the time periods mm -hmm. but the notion there is that you will have these different arrays of tables the tables have different entries on them those entries represent elements of the character's background and they allow you to build up um, some structure give you a bit of backstory give you some skills to choose from to make your character uh, unique and hopefully useful within the the party that you're going to be uh, sort of engaged with as a group mm -hmm. um, uh, and and that's the that's the the core element within sanction. But then the genre setups, things like the desanction, uh, which are ways of adding the theme to the game, build upon that by giving you different, you know, an actual set of tables from which you can then create a character. Mm -hmm. So one of the first stretch goals, which was uh, funded, uh, is for a game called uh, the Agency, which is effectively um, about um, the kind of um, disreputable uh, and forgotten and unwanted uh, spies those sort of people who might have been up and coming at one point but ultimately something bad happened or they made a really bad choice or some mission went horribly wrong and they've been pushed sort of in into the background into the basement into some distant sort of uh, regional office um, and so the the key part behind that is Again, it's what did you used to do? So, you know, one of the tables is literally about what you used to do as an operative. One of them is bizarrely about what you choose to occupy occupy your spare time with, effectively something that you do extracurricular. Mm -hmm. um, and the third thing is a magazine subscription. It's the, if somebody came into your office and sort of went through your desk, what what magazine or newspaper is it that they would find? Um, you know what is it that interests you as a person so those three things which give form to your background telling you about what you are and what you used to be give you a choice of skills you choose from those skills and as I said it then gives you you know those key points that make you an essential part of the team but also give you something to, to work from as you are building up your character yeah now given that given that and once again, dipping into the setting agnosticness of, of the game, um, I can see the potential that life paths could be akin to a blank check um, in, t in, in something that I've called blank check design. Given that, in the full book, do you have plans on, get, on putting a bit of an advice for how to create a life path system for a, get, for a given table's um, setting? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, 
essentially when I am putting uh, a setting together, you know, when I was doing desanction or when I was thinking about the agency, I had some key sort of ideas in the in in mind to ensure that um, when I was uh, I I structured the tables. Um, the first thing is ideally not to repeat any of the skills because otherwise you lose some of your uniqueness. Um, so you you know if you put common skills across m multiple options, then you end up with the possibility that people all end up with the same thing. But the notion as well is that, for example, I would try and seek to give, say, a physical and intellectual and a sort of emotional or communication type skill um, in, in at least one of the, the tables to ensure that if you choose a particular uh, option or roll a particular option, you kind of have some control over where your character is, is going because I, I, I'm conscious that the you know, p players will will have the sort of characters that they want to lean into or there may be people who want to try something a bit different mm -hmm. so there will be gui guidance about it around notionally what what you would look out for how you might choose to do it it is loose as i said that, that it, the game includes a list of something like 100 skills but mm -hmm. literally it's just a short uh, you know it, it, it's just a short section in the in the back of the the, the book um I, I, I don't want to sort of you know, leave people with um, you know, it feels like a bit of a waste of space to just list out a bunch of skills but uh, when most gamers probably can pull those ideas off the, uh, the top of their head from other games they've played but the idea is that they're there as a point of reference because I as somebody who is writing you know this sort of material I, I, I have that list in a spreadsheet <laughs> and every time I'm putting a, 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 a table together I'll use that spreadsheet, you know, and I will, you know, consider what the options are, move some skills out, move some skills in, depending upon the time period or what sort of game I'm trying to build. Um, and I will then sort of, uh, you know, I've actually got it broken down into stuff like physical, intellectual and, and communi you know, communication slash emotional. So, um, you know, it's, it's the way I do it. And I will ideally, hopefully, <laughs> be able to communicate that across the guidance. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, the, the same notion will be there for things like um, building a sort of antagonists and creatures within the game. Again, tools that I use when I sit down and try to come up with a structure, I, I will communicate those within the sort of uh, system agnostic uh, rules so that mm -hmm. uh, there is a common uh, framework and structure to work from. So um, I'm, I'm not marking anyone's homework. I'm not, you know, ultimately going to be responsible if people choose to do things a little bit different. Um, but you know, I, I hope that I'll be able to provide yeah. enough, uh, uh, enough of a tool toolbox, so to speak, to be able to work from for people to build build out their own ideas. Yeah. Now, obviously, there's obviously I w I don't want to encourage um, the bad, wrong, fun kind of thinking, but more of um, addressing an issue that can happen within um, within universe list or set or s setting agnostic games of when when of when you when you do the whole oh you can use this to run net to run anything well it's it's important to have some bit of guidance so you're not just pushing somebody off the deep end off into the deep end of the pool and just telling them swim damn it <laughs> yeah no no that's fair that's fair um I, yeah, I, I would. Um, I think that will come down to guidance. I, again, I, I um, you know, I would. I can think right now that I wouldn't. You, you wouldn't use this game for um, a setting where you are looking for godlike entities, sort of high-end superheroes, um, or indeed, you know, uh, high-end adventurers in a high fantasy. Um, this is, you know, this is <laughs> actually connecting back to our uh, earlier discussion. This is not a uh, sanction. Isn't a game to be playing Middle Earth with the Rollmaster system. It's <laughs> it's going to be playing Middle Earth with something much more sort of uh, sort of contained, you know, fighting fantasy or something where it's much more simplistic, and you're not going to be tooling Gandalf up with you know 120 different spells coming from a whole bunch of uh, major tables. Um, uh, so, um, I, I think 
a point of guidance would be that sanction is 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 likely not designed for um, high heroics um, in the sense of being able to construct um, you know sort of insane level sort of heroes or anything that like that. I think if somebody wanted to do that, they probably I I I don't want to point somebody elsewhere to go to other games, but I would I would by all means do that you know if, if you want to do that because I don't think I, I'm not trying to write that kind of game this um, it's um, really the game is about people who are they're not ordinary they, they are out of the ordinary because they are engaging in out of the ordinary activities mm -hmm. but they are not they are not yet heroes that are going to lay waste to uh, civilization, if they have a you know uh, wake up with a sore head on a Monday morning. Yeah. That being said, I, I know you said um, superheroes might not be the best idea, but what about um, street level heroes? Oh no, I could. Uh, yeah, you know, no, I, I I could see street level heroes. I could probably see you know like boys type heroes in in that. That you know, the, or that notion of the hero that has a power, but that's kind of their be all and end all. And that power, if anything, is a it's a negative. <laughs> you know, as as in they might be really capable, but it, in in and of itself is its own uh, you know weight on 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 themselves it, it, it is it's holding them back almost as much as it's pushing them forward mm -hmm. i think it, it defined in the right way I, I i don't think it would be an issue and i think it, the same notion would apply you know uh, my I, I don't want my you know creative the creative side of my brain to start kicking in mid conversation but i'm already considering you know the possibilities around you know how you would structure the skill tables and what elements of somebody's background you would use to be able to to build out that kind of uh, yeah st as you said street level uh, hero but potentially you know even above that we're not you know not necessarily because street level hero I would consider you know somebody like whatever daredevil or uh, you know the sort of individuals who have got yeah significant abilities but they're not going to be causing you know superman or uh, whatever any any problems anytime soon and I, yeah i realize i just crossed the streams there but um you know um yeah no i think there's potential there and as i said i i, I will be providing a toolbox of sorts and it's you know it's I think it's one of those situations where there will be part of a toolbox in the core rules enough to be able to bring you um, into a situation where you're comfortable to make your own hacks but at the same time as a creator who probably wants to expand the range <laughs> you know I think there's probably possibilities to introduce kind of like advanced uh, an advanced book at some later date to consider in more detail how you might bend and twist the um, the concept while retaining the same sort of notion mechanics and structure to be able to sort of bring other other genres into uh, into scope of the game. Mm -hmm. So, with as and I, I will admit that as I was going through this and and the the question of that sort of high, that sort of high powered the other thing that came to mind was more more pulp, more pulp heroes whether, whether that be the shadow or or even the phantom so how, how's yeah. that how's that for deep cuts <laughs> <laughs> well yeah yeah i mean so so the uh, the second stretch goal was for a um a genre called uh, thrust of gold which is essentially the sort of uh, flash gordon slash uh, buck rogers style pulp Mm -hmm. uh, sci-fi you know sort of uh, ray guns and 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 uh, rocket ships so i mean i think yeah i mean that's that that's the same period you know as in the, the those heroes were coming you know like the shadow and the phantom were coming out of the same comic strips mm -hmm. uh, and and radio you know dramas um and i think yeah no i i don't see any any issue with that either because if anything part of part of as i said the character generation in this is meant to look at 
how your backstory is formed alongside what skills you have available to you and what you are. And I'm not suggesting that there's any, you know, that the, the depth within the, the game is, is it's not, it's not, it's not a deep game. It's not as in, you know, your backstory is quite scant and, but it's meant to be a, a, um, a sort of straw man, a sort of a, a skeleton upon which you, you know, add add the flesh yourself, um, and I think, yeah, in in w again with the right setup and explanation, um, I think, yeah, it, it's capable of doing it. Um, and in that instance, you're probably going to, you know, have to consider the way, say, even things like the core resources are set up. Again, I um, it's it's a matter of <coughs> considering what elements of the setting need to be. Uh, sort of um, elevated to 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 really carry the the theme um, to uh, keep the, the 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 same core mechanics, but tweak them uh, thematically to uh, to to add to the theme and, and empower it uh, when when you bring it to the table, so that people know and feel the sort of genre that you're you're playing up. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I will. I will note that when when I look at the, um, uh, the potential, the um, potential set settings that were put in for these stretch goals, um, especially when I look, especially when I looked at the, the agency, I came to realize that it would it wouldn't take too much work to lean to um lean into some, lean into something akin to, I don't know, Men in Black. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, again, I mean, these. I, I mean, uh, akin to the way desanction is is worked, mm -hmm. the Men in Black is about somebody who has been taken out of their old life uh, and has been put in a extreme situation at you know uh, at potentially without their full consent, so to speak. Uh, apart from the fact that they you know sign sign something off without really realizing what they were signing off for. Um, and then are put in a situation where they use their their natural and core abilities alongside, and in this case, rather than the 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 favors, the, the angelic miracles that you get with uh, with the desanction, you're probably going to end up with some you know potential piece of tech that you always have with you, or there'll be some aspect that you can you can um, you know use uh, uh, due to being in an agent. Um, potentially even bring in the possibility that that special aspect is the fact that you're a non-human agent because you know there are clearly plenty of um, um, non-human uh, alien individuals within the, the men in black organization who mm -hmm. don't have a uh, alphabetical letter to, uh, to to be called by who nevertheless serve a function within that um, organization. So yeah, yeah. I mean, my initial thinking with the agency was things like slow horses, uh, or uh, even like the X Files, uh, which are this sort of stereotypical idea of agents who have been put in uh, difficult situations where they nevertheless are pursuing their own personal goals. But yeah, yeah. I don't see why Men in Black would not be a possibility. It has what about the Laundry that. Files? Since you, since we're going to bring up the X Files. Oh, well. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, yeah. No, laundry files. Uh, that's 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 fine as well. Yeah, absolutely. Again, you know, um, you know, I I've tinkered with the laundry in in the past. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm as a creator, I'm never quite satisfied with necessarily just using the rule system that is provided. And I think I I uh, took the laundry, which was published by Cubicle Seven, using the uh, basic role playing system, and I think I turned it. Well, I used the Gumshoe system from Pelgrain, as it happens, because. But I used the Gumshoe system that was published by. Uh, it was one of Robin Law's more unusual versions of it, basically that allow you to to structure characters in a slightly different way to the the way the main system works. But absolutely, um, you know, it, it yeah, it's an interesting. It's kind of you know your. I, I think the um, without uh, again you know trumpeting the uh, its potential as being universal because I don't. You know, it's not absolutely utterly universal. Um, I, th I think providing, yeah, you are looking at that kind of situation where 
relatively ordinary people are put into somewhat or extraordinary situations. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the sanction has the the tools uh, and and the means to be able to support that. Yeah. And I will now with that with that in mind. Um, in the desanction, you did have favors in Esoterica, which were meant to be the supernatural and and tied with the unraveling rule set. Um, obviously, that obviously you can, obviously that's not something that can be brought in when you're going when you're going agnostic. But instead, you have, if I'm not mistaken, a talent system. So, so the notion, yeah, the notion is that. Um, there is, there's always going to be the option to to use some variant of the core mechanic. That notion of either having a, an ability, perhaps that is a a dice, a, a die which can be stepped up and down, but equally potentially to use something like a usage die um, in its more black hack version where effectively you are using up so for example if i wanted to include magic in a game i'd probably have a usage die i think it would be like you know you 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 are you're know, depending on how powerful your your spell user is having a larger uh, uh, die associated with the school that you've studied might indicate how many opportunities you get to use spells and maybe if you use powerful spells you roll that die more than once when you're, you know, to see whether or not you get a one or two and it steps down. But at the same time, uh, um, potentially there are things called um, uh, countdowns, for example, which are ways to measure the time it takes for something to happen or something to um, not happen, mm -hmm. uh, depending upon what you're doing. I can potentially see those countdowns counting maybe up or down. You know, um, there are things that are outlined in Sanction and have appeared in, in, in the desanction, which are sort of basic tools and ways of handling parts of the game mechanically. Um, a, another aspect, for example, would be like, and it's quite common in other games, things like fortune or fate. So in, in desanction, you have a fortune mechanic, which means that you, you have like a token or two tokens. I think actually in core, core desanction, I'm really stingy and I only give you one, um, where, where you can re-roll the die, you know, so uh, but at the same time, you could choose, instead of re-rolling die, you might be able to spend that to cause an extra point of harm or um, remove a point of harm. In the agency, uh, for example, that mechanic is used to basically give you a number of um, opportunities to actually hurt somebody during the adventure. There is no combat mechanic as such. There's no resource that you use in the agency to be able to uh, shoot people or, or uh, engage in combat because if you think back to things like X-Files or Slow Horses or that kind of uh, espionage or spy drama we're not talking about James Bond uh, we're not talking about you know dozens and dozens of shots being fired over a single scene when people take a weapon out they take it out for a damn good reason and more often than not it doesn't actually get fired mm -hmm. um, and so the concept in the agency is if you decide you're going to then it's a, a really important decision and that's kind of the reason why it's tied to something that once you've spent it it's gone because it's like in other games where you might have as I said an opportunity to re-roll a dice or maybe in a, in a game like I don't know, Pathfinder or, or D&D where you've got and I haven't played them for a long time, but mm -hmm. I know in the old days they definitely had abilities that were like dailies or you know stuff stuff that you knew that you were only going to get that once during the adventure. You were, you know it, I, there are mechanics in Sanction that drive that thinking, you know, uh, and so you can use those and adapt those to fit your the genre that you're trying to create, and you can do them. You can do that in in ways that are. You know, sort of innovative and thematically connected to that mm -hmm. genre. So, with that with that in mind, um, I know it's meant to be a fairly light thing, and I know that stretch goals can affect this. But what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the full book? Well, I mean, at the moment, it is. 
I have to remind myself. 40, it's 48 pages at the moment. So it's a slim, it's a slim book. It's slimmer. I mean, Desanction is 68, but then Desanction has an adventure in it, uh, which runs to like a dozen pages. And Sanction, given the fact that it is a, uh, a tool set, uh, you know, uh, it, it won't have an adventure in it. So it's 48 pages. Um, so it's pretty, um, I consider myself to be a pretty uh, um, terse in terms of the way I, I write. I try and get a point across relatively quickly in writing. Mm -hmm. to admittedly, when, admittedly, when I'm talking, that that might not be the case. Um, but um, uh, uh, but you know, when when I'm laying out a rule set, um, generally speaking, it's pretty tight and limited page count wise. If only because that's the sort of game that. I can handle myself. Um, I've never, I've never been the sort of person who can sit down uh, with a, you know, a six hundred page book and have any hope of of, of finishing it. So, um, to me, having something that's got a pretty uh, tight page count uh, is uh, is a, is a way of ensuring that you don't enter into sort of fluff territory and you keep things as as focused as possible so at the moment yeah sanction is 48 pages i don't know if if somehow and obviously it would be glorious if it if it continued to rise and stretch goals were were, were broken i would you know i would be open to considering adding more pages and potentially maybe adding um whether additional tools or maybe another setting because at the moment that 48 pages is is the core rules and the agency um, as as part of the book. So you actually have the agency there to, to give you not only examples but an actually fully formed uh, genre setup to mm -hmm. to take forward. And I, I will certainly keep an eye out for it. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? So I've been <laughs> I have been very kind to myself. <laughs> And said it will be uh, March next year, but uh, at this point, and and you've obviously seen a draft. Um, at the moment, I think the core part that I haven't written is is uh, the sort of key parts of the toolbox in terms of guidance around how to structure um, the the game. At the moment, the the sanction is effectively a, a generic, you know, rule set. Uh, without the tools to be able to, you know, guide you through exactly how to use it, um, I would aspire, therefore, that maybe it will be earlier than March. I, I hate, however, <laughs> I would I wouldn't want to uh, sort of um, yeah, hoist myself by my own petard and suggest otherwise. Uh, but it would be, mm -hmm. you know, it, I would say it's possible that it will come out uh, earlier. Um, it would be nice if it came out this year rather than next year. But I, I've been generous to myself and 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 given myself to march 2024 all right i can i can certainly get that and with all that said i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here it's it's been very comfortable and i particularly enjoyed the tea <laughs> and anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as i often say around here Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay... Fucking frosty, everybody!